Welcome to BSF. My name is Vicki. We are going to be looking at Genesis 29 tonight. So with that, I will pray and we will dive right in. Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you for this time that you have given to us on this snowy day to gather uh, virtually together, but to sit at your feet um, and study your word. I pray, Father, that you would speak as you do to the places where we need to hear uh, by your spirit. Be working in our hearts and minds. Address our deepest fears and questions. And we pray, Father, that you would give us perseverance and endurance, uh, the ability to run the race more in a way that is glorifying to Jesus um, for having studied this chapter in your scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples had picked up 12 baskets of leftovers, and Jesus said to them that they needed to uh, go to Bethsaida, which was on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he would be following them, but they were to go ahead. He was going to dismiss the crowds. So the disciples got in the boat. Jesus sent them off. Jesus dismissed the crowds, and he went up to a mountaintop to pray, um, or we would think like a high hill, and looking over the Sea of Galilee. So there they were, the boat with Jesus' disciples and Jesus up on a mountain. And evening came, and the Mark the Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus' disciples were still in the boat. Jesus was still on the mountain. And Mark 648 tells us that Jesus saw them. He saw them there. The wind had risen up. It was against them, probably pushing the boat back. The disciples, many of them, were professional watermen, fishermen, and they were, and yet they could not make headway. They were straining at the oars. The, the wind was high. The waves were dangerous. <clears throat> it was about the fourth watch of the night, Mark tells us. So that is the last watch of the night, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's the time, incidentally, that God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Exodus 12 to 14. And at that fourth watch of the night, that dark, after that long night of straining at the oars, Jesus comes to them. And he's walking on the stormy sea. And it seems like he is going to pass them by. And the disciples in the boat saw him and they cried out. They were terrified. They thought Jesus was a ghost. And right away, he spoke to them over the wind and the crashing waves saying, take courage. It is I. Do not fear. Um, What does it look like for God to watch over us, for Jesus to to be with us. Sometimes everything goes right in our lives. Your boss awards you employee of the month. Your family is getting along. Your parents are getting back together. That BSF lecture (laughs) practically writes itself. Uh, You read the Bible and your heart is encouraged. You pray and you see God answer. You see, you talk about Jesus to your coworkers and they respond positively is God good? Does he love you? Is he with you? Is he for you? These, those are times when everything is going right. Answers to those questions are easily yes, 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 yes. Um, but what about when you get another rejection letter or your car breaks down again, or when you get an email from your pastor that lets you know that there has been some grievous sexual abuse that's been going on in the church And you might wonder, I might wonder, I do wonder in those times, where is God in my cousin's cancer? Where is God in the discrimination that my friend faces in her workplace every day? Where is God uh, when you pray, when you read the Bible, and you go to church, and yet nothing happens? It feels like you're flat inside and just going through the motions. And you may wonder, I may wonder, we may wonder, is God here? Is God Maybe God's not here because we've forgotten about him. We forgot about him for a week, an hour, a day, um, a year. Maybe it's because we have gotten ourselves into all sorts of problems. 
Now, some churches and Bible teachers teach that if you have hard things in your life, these people say you haven't believed enough. You haven't prayed enough. If you have hard things in your life, they say God is punishing you. They say trials mean God isn't with you. They say if God is with you and watching you, they say your life will be easy. Your bank account will be full. You'll have a nice car. There'll be blessings overflowing in easy life. But is that what the Bible actually teaches? What does it look like to have God watching over you? What does it look like when Jesus is with us? That is a core question I suggest to you that Genesis 29 invites us to consider. It would have been a relevant question for Genesis his first audience, the Israelites, if God was with them, why were they in the desert? Uh, why was life so hard? And for us now as Christians in COVID, in increasingly anti-Christian world, if God is with us, why is life hard? Why do the fruit of our ministry seem small? Why does church membership decline? If God is with us, why is it so hard? And I hope today we can learn a powerful lesson a former pastor once taught me, and it's a lesson I am still learning and relearning. Uh, I'm, these are his words, not mine, um, but I hold them clo- I hold them dear to my heart. They helped me in a very difficult time. God's people may take their eyes off God. We might sometimes. That happens. God's people sometimes take our eyes off God, but He never takes his eyes off us. God's people sometimes take their eyes off God, but he never takes his eyes off us. Let's go to Genesis 29. So open your Bible, uh, pull it up on your your device. We're going to be going through the whole chapter, 35 verses in two divisions. We'll see in the first division, verses 1 through 14, that God watches over Jacob in success. God watches over Jacob in success. Then we see the tables turn and we see verses 15 to 35. God watches over Jacob in difficulty. We're going to see delay, deception, disappointment, all sorts of difficulty. Um, But God is watching over Jacob. And because that's the kind of God that he is. He watches over his people. He does not forget his promises. Uh, And... So just a little background as we jump into Genesis 29. We've been following the journey of Abraham's family. And so we've seen in these last few chapters that there are problems in Isaac's family. Jacob, there are two twins, and Jacob deceived his father Isaac to get away uh, to steal the the uh, blessing the el- due to the blessing from his brother Esau, his older brother Esau. And um, when Isaac, when he found that out, we see that instead of punishing Jacob, he actually called Jacob to him and blessed him again, but sent him away. Why? Because Esau wanted to kill him. And um, mom was worried, uh, that's Rebecca, about Jacob getting the wrong kind of wife and um, a one who would lead Jacob's heart away from the Lord. Um, And Isaac tells Jacob, go to Uncle Laban's house, uh, get a wife from that family. And so Jacob goes out on a 500 mile journey. He's on foot. He has limited provisions, but he doesn't get very far. Maybe even the first night before God gives Jacob a dream in Genesis 28, we studied that God confirms to Jacob the amazing promises that he gave to Abraham. God's plan hasn't changed. Um, he, Jacob is God's chosen heir despite his sin and deception. And even, in fact, God promises himself to Jacob personally. And so let's start out. This is what we're hearing in our ears as we're going into Genesis um, 29. And so specifically, I'm just going to read one verse um, from God's promises, 28, 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So I am with you. I will keep you 
Watch over you, guard, observe, and I will bring you back. And Jacob responds, we see that, with worship, with reciprocity. Uh, Verse 20, he made a vow, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. And he's worried about specific things and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So the question is, what is that going to be like? What is it going to be like for God to be with Jacob and to and to keep him, to watch over him? So we're going to see that in two parts again. In success, let's jump in. Verse uh, 29, verse 1 to 6, we see Jacob gets to the right place at the right time. Certainly his journey was likely arduous and it was dangerous. He was on foot. And verse 1 actually emphasizes that in the Hebrew he lifted his foot. And so he arrives in verse two, he arrives where? He arrives uh, at a place. He looked, behold, he saw a well in the field. So he's arrived at a specific place and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. Now, when we as readers start to hear long journey, finding wife, going back to Abraham's relatives in Mesopotamia, and we hear well, we're like, ooh, this is good. Um, we remember the parallel success that God gave Abraham's store, uh, servant in finding a wife for Isaac in Genesis chapter 24. And that is the parallel that we should also be hearing in our minds as a comparison. And so, but has Jacob really arrived at the right place? And the narrator says, Yes, I suggest to you in three ways. He puts two of those behold markers. Behold in the Hebrew narrative is a shorthand for pay attention. God is at work. You need to notice this. And so um, he there's this there's something very interesting going on in particular about this field. And then as uh, Jacob starts to talk with the shepherds who are uh, the fl- uh, shepherding these three flocks that are around the well, we find that these shepherds are from the same place that Jacob's uncle Laban is, and they know him. And uh, he's evidently doing well. He, there's uh, peace he has. And so, um, and then these shepherds, we can see this is the not only the right place, it's also the right time. Because uh, as they're talking mid-conversation, wow, just like in Genesis 24, as the servant was talking to the Lord, look, uh, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And so there is, there we have it. Those are the signs that uh, we, could, we should recognize. Aha, Jacob is in the right place, the right time. And this is the right family. Now we're going to see in verse uh, 7 through 10, Jacob is going to show about himself, that he is the right kind of shepherd. And this is important because it foreshadows Jacob's role with Laban's flock. And so there are three shepherds here with their sheep, and the well is covered over with a stone at this point. And um, Jacob knows better than that. He said, verse 7, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. So, what are they waiting for? Are they waiting just out of procedure, possibly? Or can they not physically move the stone? It's not clear exactly, but we can infer this. And I suggest to you that Genesis's original audience, who were shepherds, Uh, and had flocks in the desert, they would have understood that daytime is the hot time. You do not have herd animals sitting in the hot sun without water, without grazing. Um, That is not how to care for animals. And having grown up on a farm, I can, I can like share that with you too. Don't, don't do that with your animals. Um, And so we see then verse nine uh, and 10, Rachel, by the way, whose name means you, uh, female sheep, E-W-E, arrives with Laban's sheep. And the question we have, uh, what's going to happen to Laban's sheep? 
uh, are they going to broil in the hot sun too? And we see verse 10 with, has very quick and startling action. And we're going to see Jacob as his mother's son. And remember how Rebecca on her own initiative, probably with God's empowering, watered 10 thirsty camels all by herself. And similarly, and more remarkably here, Jacob hefts this large stone that's over the, the top of the well and waters Laban's whole flock also by himself. That, even though it goes, the narrator tells us this very quickly. Um, now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, or you, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So, um, This took great time and effort to move all that water, but it foreshadows what we will see unfold in the next chapter. Jacob shows himself to be a good steward and a a shepherd. Jacob also has a recurring motif of stones. Stones are important in his life. We've seen now two big stones in his life, the one at Bethel and now this one by the well uh, when he meets Rachel. He moves stones. He sets up pillars at important times. So we'll see that throughout his life. Um, And we also see this sets the trajectory for Jacob's occupation and the occupation of Jacob's house, his family, the Israelites. Genesis 47.3, we will see they settle in Goshen because there's the famine uh, and because Goshen is the good grazing land. And I'm sure in a practical sense, this too, um, you know, Rachel's watching this you know, guy, I assume he's sort of handsome and he's working here and moving. And I imagine that she uh, took that in, in a positive way. Um, And we can see uh, in verse 11 to 14, after this action, there's a hinge, there's a turn. Um, Jacob and his right family show right mutual affection. And so I say there's a hinge because in the Hebrew, there is a word play between the uh, Hebrew for and he watered and and he kissed. They sound almost identical uh, via shock, via shek. Um, Jacob's care of Laban's flocks was also very similar to his familial affection. And so this is actually a wordplay that the, the poet of the Song of Songs uses as well. Um, Jacob is overcome by emotion. So let's read verses 12 to 14. Uh, And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son and that she, and she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him uh, a month. So Rachel's running suggests, like Rebecca's, uh, that this her, she's willing for what this is going to happen. We're thinking as good readers, there's a betrothal uh, in progress. Laban's warm response also leads us to expect A marriage is in promise, especially his words, which echo Adam's words to Eve, you are my bone, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Of course, things are going to hit a snag in the next verse, but let's pause at this point um, and just reflect. Was God faithful to his promise to Jacob in 2815 when he said, I am with you, I'll be watch over you wherever you go? And did did Jacob reciprocate? Uh, Did he keep his vow? And so... I suggest to you, I mean, it'd be great. (laughs) I hope you have a good time discussing with your group that. uh, But I think Jacob got to the right place at the right time and aligned himself, the right goods family, that we should see God's fingerprints all over that. That's, yes, God's care. He is with Jacob. Um, And even though the narrator doesn't relate any overt piety from Jacob, like the servant when he prayed, um, Jacob is marked by obedience. He's cooperating with the overall plan as an heir of God's uh, covenant with Abraham. Jacob needed to be married and to this specific girl, looks like. And he also shows a a very cooperative initiative that reflects uh, God's care. So a principle I think that we can learn as we reflect on these this first part of the chapter 
as God watches over us, everything needing to happen will happen. As God watches over us, everything needing to happen will happen. It will happen when it is supposed to happen and where it is supposed to happen. And by God's grace, we as God's people will cooperate in ways that show God's supernatural empowering, like we saw even with Jacob in verse 10. And our right response then is to cooperate, is to trust that God is in control, uh, that when things need to happen, they will happen, and then to respond and to, to recognize that and, re- and cooperate with courage and let our lives be a canvas to display God's empowering. Several years ago, um, actually many years ago, I was, I was in San Antonio, Texas, and I was waiting. I was waiting to see what would happen. I was there at uh, BSF headquarters, actually, as a part of teaching leader training. And I was waiting for Gene Nystrand, who was then the executive director, to come in and to sit in the dining room. And I was waiting to see if she would arrive I was waiting to see if there, uh, if anyone else would sit at her table, um, and if I could go to her, and confess a lie that I had told to her the day before. So I was there um, previously. So the backstory to that is uh, when BSF teaching leaders are trained. It's an intensive time. It's a week, and we have lots of opportunities, like at the dinner table, to get to meet other people in BSF and leaders, including our executive director. At that time, it was Jean. And so I was there, one of the meals for that week, and sitting at her table over, must have been lunch, and I, uh, we were sharing, we were all sharing our stories, and I shared something to her um, that I uh, was not true. And I knew at the time that it wasn't true. It was small. It was like, it was something to the tune of, I said, um, I was so surprised when uh, I was in, you know, asked to pray about becoming a teaching leader as I had never thought about anything like that. Um, like, it was very tiny. The truth was, actually, I had thought about that. And I thought about it multiple times. And I felt like God was drawing me toward doing something so crazy, even though I was terrified of public speaking and still am actually uh, afraid of public speaking in many ways. Um, But so I I lied to her. God convicted. It was of an hour later, like like we were in a training session, session, not of the blue. The Holy Spirit convicted me that I had lied to her and that I... Could not only well that's part of my story too is that I as uh, before I was a, a Christian I lied I lied a lot I lied to impress people I lied uh, to get out of trouble I lied and that was a marker of something that God did miraculously um, by His grace as I as He brought me over from death to life in Christ and made me a new person He was removing those habits from me and putting truth in my mouth instead of lies and courage to say things as they as they were and so um and i you know when i realized oh my goodness here i am and this old sin of lying has come up again i was so devastated and i confessed that to the lord and i mean i i agreed with him it was totally sin and i shouldn't have done it but i i understood that he wanted me to confess that to her, the executive director, about something. It was so small. Like I was, I argued with the Lord for the whole rest of the day. Like she wouldn't remember it. It was just not a big deal. I there were so many reasons why I shouldn't do that. She was so busy. Why would why would I bother her with that? And yet the Lord would not let it go. And finally, to the end of the day. I'm exhausted. I don't remember any of the training that went on because I was wrestling with the Lord. And I said, okay, but you have to do it. I can't do it. So I gave the Lord all these stipulations. And there I was waiting at the, at the breakfast time. And I was waiting, as I said, Jean has to be there. And nobody else can be sitting at her table. She has to come back. We went through the buffet. Both of us would be there. 
And you know what? That is exactly what happened. And it really, it shouldn't have happened because who doesn't want to sit with Gene Eister and the executive director? I mean, everybody wanted to. And so, um, yeah, I like he did it. And so, and he gave me the courage to sit down and to, to confess that to her. And it was, it was what joy, but I am so thankful. Sorry to me to cry that the Lord let me start this role with a clean conscience that I didn't have that um, sin or deception that I had um, not been manipulated anything and but I remember just how God it was supposed to happen and it did happen and he he empowered me it was not because oh Vicki you're so awesome like I lied to the executive director over something super stupid like, that's the kind of person I am apart from Christ. And yet, he gave me the courage to do that. So, when God watches over us, everything needing to happen, we can trust that it will happen. And this, even though it might not be the everyday norm in our everyday lives, that we see things come, you know, like all these pieces come together, there will be those times. Because God is that kind of God. He works that way in his people's life. And guess what? If you are a believer in Christ, you are a part of his larger purposes. And he is aligning you. He's aligning me with his larger purposes in the world in very intricate and delicate and very small, minute ways. And what this means is for you and for me that you and I, we have not wrecked our lives. We have not wrecked them so far that they have been completely derailed from God's purposes. Yes, our actions do have consequences, but you and I do, we're frankly not that powerful. We do not have the power to thwart God's greater purposes. Have you seen God's fingerprints on events in, in your life? Are you, how do you recognize them? How can you tell it's the Lord and not just convenient circumstances? Will you pray? Will you study the Bible to learn his character? Uh, God works in ways that are consistent with his character. He will never do anything that is inconsistent. And he's not working just to make you happy. Um, he, God, is a much bigger plan than that. Um, I mean, happiness will be a part of his ultimate plan for us. But right now, it's holiness. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to be aligned with his greater purposes. Will you... Pray for God's courage to recognize, to trust, or to trust first, right? To recognize and to cooperate. Um, and one thing, if you pray that God will give you opportunities to share the gospel, you can be certain. <laughs> I have found he always answers those prayers rather swiftly. Um, that is a great encouragement. God's people, sometimes we take our eyes off God. But he never takes his eyes off us. So let that be our encouragement, especially because most of our life isn't all when everything is also perfect and it's also successful. We have delay. We, have, we suffer because our own sin and for other people's sin. And we have disappointments. And God uses all this growth for good. All that for growth and for good. And so that's where we're going in our next division. God watches over Jacob in difficulty, verses 15 to 35. And so we remember we're, we're keeping in mind the parallel of Genesis 24. Um, in Genesis 24, Abraham's servant found the girl, got permission from the family, and left within a span of 24 hours. Uh, now we know Jacob's situation is going to be a little different because Jacob can't go back because Esau wants to kill him. And so he has different challenges. There will be delay. He's going to have to stay. But he also showed up without camels and riches. And there's some suggestion that Laban, uh, Uncle Laban super likes those things. And so we see that the wedding is delayed. Um, and we know that Jacob's stay is marked with work. That's the first thing we notice in uh, verse 15. Um, stayed with them a, m a month, and then, then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Okay, so verse 10 was not just a once off. Tell me, what should your wages be? And so Uncle Laban lets, uh, lets Jacob 
asks for something um, for his wages. And so the narrator gives us a backstory. There's an older, younger dynamic in uh, Laban's family, too. Uh, there were two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak. We don't know what that means, but in the contrast, it doesn't seem like it was particularly appealing to Jacob, whatever that meant. Um, but Jacob was beautiful, or sorry, Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. J- Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you, Uncle Laban, seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And uh, that was, by the way, a um, Jacob was, see how specific he was in his bargaining. Um, he's a good bargainer, and we'll see that later. Um, he, in the Hebrew, really emphasizes, it's very clear, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your daughter, the younger one. Um, there's no confusion about the deal of their um, of, of his request and like his proposal. And it seems that uh, Laban responds. It was customary for a prospective husband in the ancient Near East to give the bride's family a large gift. And so Jacob didn't have money with him. Um, but he generously offers seven years of indentured servitude. Um, it, verse, it, Laban's apparent response is sort of, um, it is actually, well, okay, I'll read it. Laban said, it is better that I serve, this, better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. Okay, that is actually true, right? If you have, if this is an opportunity to align your daughter with, the heir of God's like covenant promises with Abraham, absolutely, it is better that uh, Rachel would be with her. But it doesn't sound that flattering. It doesn't seem like Lake Laban recognizes God's work in this, and um, perhaps he's starting to uh, he's underwhelmed or he acts underwhelmed because he wants to have a better bargaining uh, solution later on. And so then we see in verses 21 to, uh, so actually 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Um, and then he goes, verse 21 to 30, and he is, uh, it's time for his uh, wedding to Rachel. And it's already delayed, but it's now complicated, we see by Laban's deceit. Le- Jacob is going to pay double to marry Rachel. Um, and before, but we, here is really a place, I think, where we see uh, God's school. <laughs> Jacob before was a trickster, a bargainer, a liar, and then God met him. And in that, they're, they're silent. We, he, the journey was silent. These seven years were silent. Um, but Jacob has not been sitting around doing nothing. He's become a shepherd. He's endured hard things. He's focused on care for those who do not do good for him. That, or I mean, they're not even his sheep. If you read chapter 31, verses 38 to 40, you can read in his own words some of the things that he endured. And like Mo- Moses and David, Jacob went to shepherd school um, with God, and that was a preparation for his character. And so we see this is a different kind of Jacob. Um, Jacob's changed. And uh, he's worshiped God, recognizes God's direction. He cooperates with God. He works hard. He's overlooked Laban's slights. He's been generous. He set his eyes on what God wanted for him as a covenant heir. He's had a good attitude. He's been faithful and chaste toward the woman he steadfastly loves. And so um, we, I think we're supposed to see this in a very good light. Jacob has been a cooperative student in God's school of sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which God transforms his people to be in reality what he has already declared them to be, holy and set apart for God's purposes um, in a progressive way, growing to image God or to resemble, the to be more and more like Jesus. This is the process of becoming, becoming fully Uh, belonging to God completely and without reservation. Sanctification is a process that is a part of every Christian's uh, experience. It's part of God's school for us. Um, In fact, disciple is means in the Greek, like it actually means learner. And that's who we are called to be. We're called to be learners in God's school. 
And God uses seasons of delay, complexity, and disappointment in that this is a process that's it's long and ongoing. It will not be completed until we see him. Um, and yet it is in very substantial and meaningful ways at work. He is at work now. And sanctification is a divine work. Um, it's a work of the Holy Spirit, meaning God is doing it in us. And isn't that a relief, right? Because if something depended solely on us. My goodness, that would be, um, we would be in a tough, we would be in tough shape. And yet God calls us to cooperate. We must cooperate with faithful obedience, prayer, um, in, in like where we are in redemptive history, that will include Bible study, will include fellowship, it will include um, being in a community of believers, uh, the service of God and his people in the world. Um, we also cooperate by receiving circumstances in our lives as God's means, loving means to grow us. And so we... T- this Jacob, we see, has grown in these silent years. How have you grown in your silent years? Maybe you're in silent years right now. Um, what are you doing to help? How is God growing you? Sometimes life gets harder, not easier. And we see that in verse 22 to 24. Um, Laban, um, Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife so I may go into her for my time is completed. That was a good and right desire for him to have um, so Laban gathered together all the people of the place. Yay, he's saying yes, right? And made a feast. Um, but in the evening, he took his daughter, Leah. Wait, what? Leah. That's the wrong name. And brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And we have um, information about a, a, ser- a female servant who will um, become cl- clear. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? So sometimes, um, now we might wonder, how did this happen? Um, There is some irony there, right? Because Jacob deceived uh, Isaac. Now Jacob the deceiver is being deceived. And so um, in the ancient Near East culture, remember the groom and the bride were kept separate. And the the bride was veiled. Remember how Re- Rebecca veiled herself in twenty four sixty five. There were no electric lights. There was a bustle and noise of a party. There were probably imbibing of adult beverages. And so we can recognize how it was done. Surely Jacob had some clues. Well, Isaac had some clues too, but um, still they were both tricked. Um, and it might be tempting to say that God had arranged things so that Jacob got what he deserved. It might be tempting to see present suffering in your life or in somebody else's life and connect the dots for them and say, see, because you did this, now that's why you're suffering. Um, but it does, it's not so easy. Um, God's economy does not uh, work in the moment always you reap what you sow. Why? We don't have the full vision to see the ways of God. God is always merciful and always just at the same time. And only his wisdom knows how to sort all that out and can work everything for for good, ultimately, um, for the good of those in Christ, um, for those who are lo- love him and are called according to his purpose. We do see that God does intervene in history Um, And even though our sins have real consequences in our lives, God does not treat us as fully as our sins deserve. He doesn't. Um, Not now. However, the day is coming when God, as our righteous and merciful judge, will bring all things to a reckoning. He will settle the accounts. um, And God is leaving a lot for that final reckoning, and he will mete out complete justice. Why is he doing that? God does not delight in the punishment and destruction of sinners. He desires repentance. This is a delay for our good, and it's letting people come into the body of Christ, people like me, people I hope like you. And here's the proof. How can we know that this is God's heart? God sent Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. When Christ hung on the cross, he bore all the sins of those who would trust in him, our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, and he paid it. Our just punishment for sin has been paid for, and Jesus' resurrection attests to that. 
they are, our balance has been settled in full. But those who do res- refuse God's gift of mercy in Christ, they will, they are choosing to reap God's justice for sin at the final, at that final day. God's economy is too complex for our eyes to trace out from this vantage point. Um, in fact, Hebrews 4, Hebrews 13 tells us that God disciplines his sons and daughters because he loves us. God's discipline feels a lot like suffering. And so often the means that God uses to sanctify us are creative. They involve suffering. And as we are united in Christ already, so too we do share in his sufferings. Christ was perfected in his suffering. The scriptures tell us that. And how much, if if that was true for him, how much more for us? Um, Jacob suffers, Israel suffers, the church suffers. Um, and yet that is loving discipline. God orchestrates the circumstances of our lives so creatively and intricately that those areas that he sees, uh, we need to grow, are prodded and poked until the growth happens. Um, Though it is painful, take comfort that God intends to grow and bless you if you are in Christ. Um, And so, Last, what it, Laban gives his weak excuse, uh, so back to 29, 25. Alas, what was done is done. Um, Jacob was married to Leah, and Jacob's growth has not been in vain. I love it that he did not, um, he doesn't try to divorce Leah or discredit Laban. Um, he accepts complexity and delay. And um, in the end, twice of long of service, there was a sort of back to back wedding week. Um, Jacob is finally married to Rachel, but there is now a sad and painful complexity. There is servitude, favoritism, rivalry, and suffering. We can see that in verse 30. Um, So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Um, So Jacob has multiple wives. That's confusing. Are we supposed to follow this example? We have to discern where the Bible is being descriptive. This is what did happen. And where the Bible is prescriptive. This is what should happen. This situation seems to be in light of Genesis uh, 2.23 and the pain that's in this account. This seems to be a descriptive. This is not God's intended best will. Um, for husbands to have multiple wives or wives to have multiple husbands. But we can be encouraged, especially in the places that our lives are descriptive, not prescriptive. They're not in alignment with the way that thing, things should be. This doesn't mean that the Lord isn't with us. Is he not watching over us? Um, so we see in these last uh, verses in our chapter, the Lord intervenes in Jacob's family disappointments and disaster. Um, we can see that whatever the situation was, um, God was not pleased with how Leah was treated. Um, When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Um, And so we see God intervened and had compassion on uh, Leah. God loved Leah, and he gave her a fourfold blessing Um, that certainly Rachel wanted. Rachel wanted to have children. And I'm sure Jacob probably wanted Rachel to have all the children. Um, But that was not God's plan. Leah went, we can see in the names of those children, Leah went to the Lord's school of sanctification too. She suffers, but God grows her for good um, and his glory. Um, And some of the blessing that came out of that is amazing because we know from our vantage point um, that the Lord Jesus Christ came from um, Leah and Jacob and from the son Judah. Now, some of us may be angry to see Leah treated this way. Um, we may wonder how a good God could not only allow specific hurt and wrong like this, but maybe even systems of oppression and wrongdoing. And there are no easy answers to those questions Um, The reality of life is after Genesis 3, our whole world is broken by sin. And that includes people's relationships with each other. Um, And so the hope that the Bible gives is that God's project of redemption is full, is complete, um, in that nothing will be left unaddressed um, in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns, suffering and injustice will not win. Um, 
they somehow God promises to take everything and use it for the good of those who love him and are courted, called according to his purpose. And so um, life involves delays and disappointments and pain, but here's the principle I think we can learn. As God watches over us, suffering bears good fruit. As God watches over us, suffering bears good fruit. Um, there was a there's a plant I read about today uh, or recently on social media where it was flopping over, but the owner found that if she shook the stem, the stalk, for two minutes a day, that it would grow straight and tall. And now it's like this big, tall plant. And um, how much... We, we don't like the shaking. We don't like the suffering. And yet God uses, um, God can use suffering to bear good fruit. Um, and it doesn't, shaking in waves do not mean that God isn't watching over you. Suffering and hardship is an opportunity for growth. Don't waste it. Um, what suffering have you endured? And can you see glimpses of the good fruit that God has brought out of it? Is your stock growing stronger and straighter? Or has suffering made you bitter? Sometimes it can. Pushed you away from God. Suffering will change us. Will it change you in the right way? Um, if you have are inclined toward bitterness, I encourage you, pray. Ask the Lord to soften your heart and come back to Him so that you will grow straight and strong. Many of us have suffered, maybe some of us have suffered greatly in the cause of Christ, and that is a great honor. <laughs> um, for those saved in Christ, God is with us now and forever, and our, our suffering in Christ's name honors Jesus. Know that suffering will not have the last word. Why? Because God's people, sometimes we do. We take our eyes off God, but God never takes his eyes off us. And complexities and delay and deceit and our own hard, weird situations, they do not discourage God from pushing in. And um, what were the disciples thinking and feeling in that boat all through the night, hour after hour? Jesus was praying for them. He never took his eyes off them. But why didn't he come to them sooner? Mark doesn't tell us. It It was for their good. What was Jacob thinking and feeling and through that long journey and the 14 plus years of serving Laban? What was Leah thinking and feeling during that time? What was Rachel thinking and feeling? Why was all that necessary? Moses doesn't tell us, but we can trust this. Our God is purposeful. There is no such thing as needless suffering or needless success. To quote uh, Pinky Lindell, a dear friend and faithful BSF leader, she, she writes, we cannot know God's mind, but we can know his heart. God loves you and he promises in Christ to be God with us to all who trust in him. How will you make God, God's heart, the focus of your eyes in your present suffering? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for keeping us, loving us, and um, helping us in the most painful and most complex areas of our lives. Father, we, we ask We thank you that you don't take your eyes off us, and would you help us to cooperate with you? Um, Make us more and more like Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.